Hello, Pastor Doug, back again with another video. Today I want to do another poll quiz video. As you know, I love taking polls and quizzes that I find online. I, I think it's so interesting. As always, you learn more about the people asking the questions than sometimes you learn about yourself. But it's always good to be challenged by good questions. And as always, we're going to do this cold. I'm just going to see where it goes. I found this. I think it's a Christian site, but has a very interesting name. Search for Me Ministries, a growing adventure. I will refrain from being too snarky. I don't know anything about this organization, but that's an interesting title. But let's move on. Let's take their quiz. What is truth? Great question. Um, our you know, pilot asked that. Didn't get a direct answer because we were standing before truth, but I digress. What is truth? It differs for each person. That's the modern answer. That's crazy. Nothing but, but a lie. That would be contradictory by itself. The expression of reality. Yeah, okay. Something you can't handle. Oh, I really want to do deep. Go Jack Nicholson. Um, but it's going to be the expression of reality, um, truth, the technical definition, the most common definition of truth is that which corresponds to reality. So we're going to go with this one, and we got it right. Yay, let's move on. All right, what does it mean when Genesis 127 that says that God created man in his image? Each of us is a demigod. No, we're made in the image of God, but we're not demigods. Religious men should sport long gray beards. Oh. Oh, that's the answer I want to give. Yeah. Uh, we each have the freedom and capacity to love. Ugh. Uh, every person has the divine spark that eliminates darkness. Oh. They want me to take this one. I got a feeling because it's the squishy answer. And it's true. You know, because we're in the image of God, we do have the capacity for love. That's not wrong. But as always, when you get any quote from the Bible, go read it in context. For the context of Genesis 127, what's the main focus of being in the image of God? What follows next? That God, sorry, that man has dominion. That he goes and rules over creation. That's the focus of what the image of God is, at least in context. And it's true, we do have things like intellect, we have the capacity to, do, you know, to love and do justice, all those other good things. I have a feeling they want us to answer this one. We, we each have the we have the freedom and capacity to love. Every person has divine spark that eliminates darkness. I'm going to go with this one because being in the image of God, we are we have something in us that's divine that we can't eliminate the darkness. It's only by God's grace. But I, I just I don't like this answer. I'm going to go with this one, and it's wrong. So yay, break the machine. Moving on. Where do, where do we most see the current influence of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? which just doesn't exist anymore, just at least disappears in the biblical story. In Fangor Forest, I love that answer. In the working, in the workings of the human conscience, well, yeah, I mean, the influence of good and evil, because the fall, we come to know that there's good and evil, so that affects our conscience. At the produce section of our local grocery store, okay. In the New Testament Gospel of Grace, well, gr the gospel is a remedy to the cause of evil so i guess we're gonna go with b sure all right moving on what was the big lie in the garden of eden adam and eve would be like god apart from god yeah an apple a day keeps a doctor away no forbidden fruit does not have seeds <laughs> okay propaganda is the most effective in the mouth of the serpent i kind of like that answer that's kind of a fun answer but it's going to be this, Adam and Eve would be like God apart from God. Um, you know, that's true, that we don't need God, but we're going to be like our many gods. We're definitely going to go with that one. Yep, and that's right. So, relating to Genesis 3-7, which of the following are figurative fig leaves that people use to cover their shame? Well, Genesis is literally true, so there were literal fig leaves, but we'll play along. Um, pleated 3D ghostware. I have no idea what that means. Wealth and beauty. Okay. Social media metadata. I like this answer. None of the above. I really want to go with C, but I got a feeling it's with wealth and beauty. Now, technically, wealth and beauty are not evil. Those are good things. There's nothing that's 100% evil. But obviously, those things we use in a very evil way because of our fallen nature. So, sure, we're going to go with this one. Okay. We got that right. What's next? What does the Bible say about pride? Dangerous thing. There's no better way to motivate people 
It is deadly. That's the answer. Without pride in oneself, life has no meaning. That's a modern answer. Small doses of pride make for a healthy identity. That's also a very modern answer. Uh, our culture tells us pride is a virtue. It's not. It is a deadly sin. So that's the correct answer. And good. You got it right. What's next? Why does evil exist? Ooh, that's a deep question. Because God is good. Actually, I like that. that. That's a good short answer. That needs to be explained more, but that's not bad. Because Satan is all-powerful? No, he's a mere creation. Without evil, we wouldn't have any televised police dramas? True, true facts. Uh, because God spends too much time watching the angels and the saints? I don't know what that means. I assume that's a joke. Because God is good? That's going to be the correct answer. Though that, of course, needs to be fully thought out, and that is a deep question. You know, because there is evil, we more clearly see grace. We more clearly see God's main plan, his plan A, redemption through his son. So that's not a bad short answer. And I get a chicken dinner. Yay. Anyways, let's keep on reading. What is God's preferred way of dealing with guilt? Well, what do you mean by guilt? Do you mean like I feel guilty? I feel sorry that I have been, that I am guilty before God I'm because of my lawlessness? What do you mean? But anyways, let's read on. Uh, what is God's preferred way of dealing with guilt? Make us do penance? Uh, we are to repent. That's true. He likes to remind us daily of our moral failures? Absolutely. That's by God's grace. He provides forgiveness through the cross of Jesus Christ? I don't like the word provides. God does not try to save people. He saves people. He created alcohol so we can drown our sorrows. Um, uh, they, they want us to take this answer. What is God's preferred way of dealing with guilt? With guilt? Again, what a horrible word, preferred. God does. God does not try. Especially when we're dealing with salvation. Uh, obviously, the gospel removes, removes our guilt before God. So I'm going to go with this, and yeah, but again, don't like the watered-down uh, verbiage. Nine, why does faith play such a large role in the teachings of the Bible? Blind faith is better than weak love? No, um, you can't have love unless you have faith, the, uh, true love. The more we talk about faith, the farther we get from reality, quite the opposite. Without faith, there is no reality. Um, there is no knowledge unless you have faith. Faith is anything. Faith in anything gives people reason to hope. That's not true. Faith in Christ gives hope, which gives love. It's impossible to have an intimate relationship with God if we do not trust in Him. <sighs> the Bible talks a lot about faith, and from tr obviously we are justified by faith and faith alone. But from faith comes hope, and from hope comes love, and love is the fulfillment of the law, where we love God and love our neighbor. You know, this talk about God wanting to have an intimate relationship with us, you know, that's not wrong, but that's such modern language. It's such modern self-focused language. Uh, this is going to be the answer, but I don't like the New Agey speak. Let's keep on going. What does the Bible say about Jesus Christ? He sinned only once when he was 13 years old. Nope, he's without sin. He was born both fully God and fully man. There's the answer. He was the most handsome man in Galilee. No, the only physical description of the Lord Jesus Christ is in the book of Isaiah. And he said, and it says he was not that attractive. We learned about hard work and sacrifice while he learned about hard work and sacrifice while laboring in his parents' vineyard. Uh, no. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, you could do some interesting metaphors in the Old Testament of the vineyard, but we will not go there. Uh, he was born both fully God and fully man. That's obviously what the Bible teaches. Okay, so these guys are Christians. I mean, these are getting uh, the basics of uh, orthodoxy down. Which definition applies to God's grace? The unmerited favor of God. That is the correct, simple definition of, uh, of God's grace. The power to live in victory over sin. No. Uh, the, the Lutherans have taught me about this one. Now, obviously the grace of God is powerful and grace is how we live but we do, uh, we live and we live in the gospel however we do not have a theology of glory 
The purpose of the gospel is not a theology of glory. It's a theology of the cross. And it's not about us having a victorious life. It is about us resting in the cross. So this is a theology of victory, as Luther warns. And that's a problem. That's a, uh, sorry, a theology of glory as opposed to a theology of the cross. Hmm. The power to serve God beyond our human abilities. I don't know what that means. All of the above. Oh, they so want us to take D. No, I'm going to go with the simple definition. There's truth to B and C, but they're very poorly worded. So we're going to go with A. And we're wrong. Um, again, I, I need to do a video about the theology of glory versus the theology of the cross. One of the most dangerous doctrines is the notion that we're supposed to go out and have a victorious life. Yes, we are to die daily to sin. Yes, we are to live daily for Christ. But that's not having victory. It's about having rest in the cross. It's about humbleness, about being humble. It's about being meek. It's about, it's about being driven to our knees and then daily trusting in Christ. So if you get a chance, if you want to learn more about that, go, go, go to type in like Google or some other search engine, type in Luther, theology of the cross versus theology of glory, and you'll see what I mean. Let's move on. What is God's greatest desire? For all people to be good. No. For us to follow the rules without complaining. Uh, sure. <laughs> to be intimate with human beings. Oh, this is going to be the answer they're going to want. I got a feeling. For a really good cup of milk chocolate chip. You know, I, I appreciate some humor, but you know, humor about God. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. All right. For all people to be good. Uh, no. For us to follow the rules without complaining. You well, know, he does want his law obeyed to be intimate with humans. God doesn't try to be intimate with humans. Where, do, where in the Bible does it say, I'm God, you know, this is the Almighty is trying to be intimate with humans? I'm sorry. I got a feeling this is the answer they want. I'm going to go with B. Just I think it's the closest. It's not a great answer, but see what happens. Yep, that's what I thought. So, oh, it's complete. Let's see if I, let's see, did I graduate or did I get their certificate? Um,. Do, 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 it's thinking, ah, 9 out of 12. You did okay, but there's definitely room for improvement. To learn more about the Christian faith, please download a free copy of The Age of Abiding, Experiencing the Life of the Vine. Uh, yeah, no. All right, so these guys on some marginal level, I think obviously are Christian. They understand the basics of Christian doctrine. But I, I think you can see what happens when you try to make the faith practical and relevant and you know, to talk in more emotional, individualistic language, I think it's dangerous. Um, there was some th clear theological mistakes in this poll. It, it was interesting to take, but I certainly would not recommend going and reading these folks. You know, go read Calvin, go read Augustine, go read someone who actually knows what they're talking about. Well, I hope that helps. And as always, Christ, grace, and peace to you all. Amen.